started. Uh, this is, we're going to talk about the importance of using the blower door in rehab. Um, my name is Phil Hall. I'm the director of training at the New River Center for Energy Research and Training. We're located in Christiansburg, Virginia, just about 25 miles south of here on 81. If you're shaking your head we're like right down here. You, you don't know where Christiansburg is, we'll just no, no, I don't. go out there to 81, take a left and yeah, right. drive straight and you'll find Christiansburg. So we're, we're <laughs> close by. Um, we have a training center that teaches building science and weatherization concepts. We train contractors like Brian Clark here. He's come to our um, facility to become a building analyst and uh, hopefully you're using that every day to serve habitat, right? Every day. You want to tell, tell them what you learned at the center? A lot of things that I had done wrong <laughs> well, we don't. That, that we don't want to advertise that, no, but <laughs> no, no. Just, uh, just ways of looking at a project very differently. Um, yeah. Looking at it start to finish and the whole, the whole system approach. Yeah. So a lot easier to evaluate it up front than it is to fix it afterwards. Yeah. So we teach the the house is a system concept. Um, we teach also this device right here. It's a blower door. How to use this blower door to direct your work scope, uh, to evaluate the house for its effective leakiness, basically, how loose that house is, how, uh, how much that house is breathing on its own, basically, uh, and how much we don't want it to breathe on its own. So when we start to tighten it up, um, we want to retest the house with the same blower door so we know the start and the end of the project, you know, um, how big that hole was maybe in the beginning, and then now how small it is now at the end. And then, which then leads us into uh, what we will talk about in the last session. Um, hopefully you will stay, stick around for that <laughs> session. Um, and we'll talk about when you get the house tight enough um, and hopefully really tight, uh, what you need to start thinking about as far as ventilation. You know, because houses don't need to breathe, but we need to take into account that maybe there might be some moisture that we need to control if it gets into the house or moisture that builds up inside the house from us as human beings, etc. But also um, the humans inside the house need to breathe. And so that's a pitch for Brian, but he's going to talk about ventilation and strategies for that. So that Brian there and, and, and this Brian can pitch in on that, you know, and what his experience is potentially because uh, we like to hear from you all as well. So anytime that you guys want to pitch in, uh, feel free to and ask me questions throughout this session um, because I learn a lot from my students um, as well when I'm training. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and we'll dive into this. Um, I know it's Friday afternoon and everybody's kind of like, oh, it's a great lunch. And there's probably a bunch of other places you'd rather be. So we'll keep it pretty simple, but please stop me if you know, if I'm going too fast. So in the past and now, as we build new homes, um, we've had kind of a prescriptive approach as to what to use. And here we have this chart now that we're using on new construction. Um, this is a thermal bypass checklist, but this is also in the code um, that is starting to, to come out uh, in the new code. Um, that is stating if you are not going to do a blower door test on your new homes, this is here in Virginia, here's a prescriptive approach of how you need to build the house. Okay? And you need to basically seal everything on this line and, and uh, build the ceiling and attic in this particular way and, and make sure that your walls are this tight and your windows and doors are sealed in this way. And when I say sealed, I mean that, you know, all your cracks and your holes and your, you know, your, your air barrier, the, that surface that separates your outdoor air from your indoor air is continuous, meaning complete, um, is really tight and can sustain, in essence, a pressure test. Just like if you were to uh, install plumbing in your house, you wouldn't want your plumbing to leak, right? So if uh, a plumber did not do a pressure test on the pipes, this would be the prescriptive 
plumbing installation list, meaning you need to make sure that you install a certain amount of pipe dope, you need to make sure that your connections fit a certain way, you need to make sure that everything is installed A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, and on down. Because if you're not going to test it, then you have to install it a certain way so that visually we can confirm that it's tight enough, all right? This can be difficult to do because visually we often make mistakes and it's hard to look at a house and say, yeah, I don't see any holes or it looks like it's tight enough. So that's why we like to use this blower door because the blower door is the only way to confirm that you have a tight house because it's, it pressure tests your house just like you'd pressure test your plumbing system, you know, on your house. Okay. So what are we testing? We're testing the building envelope and the building envelope consists of an air barrier and a thermal barrier. And that air barrier, like I said, is that barrier, your physical barrier that you can touch that separates the conditioned air from the unconditioned air. Okay, that's your exterior walls, your interior walls, all right? And a good building envelope, as you see here, will be continuous wherever it is, okay? Depending on the shape and style of your house, it may be a little bit different, it may be out here. You know, if it's got a basement, it may go down. If it's crawl space and it's closed crawl space, it may go down here in the earth. It just depends, okay? So no two houses are necessarily alike. No two air barrier lines, you know, go in the same shape and form. It's just wherever that air barrier is, it needs to be continuous. If there's any breaks, then that's a gap or a hole, and we need to find it and seal it, right? In new construction, it's easy because as we build it, we can seal it as we go. But how do we find those holes, say in this environment right here? Can we see them? You know, they're probably behind the walls. They're in the walls. They're in the ceiling. They're in cavities that are hard to get to. And so that's where the blower door can come in. Because the blower door can test this entire box at one time. Just like hooking up a pressure gauge and pressure testing your plumbing lines on your house, it tests the entire system at once, and then we can go about looking for the leaks once we have pressure tested it. Does that make sense? Yes? You didn't nod. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was just making sure you didn't nod because you, you didn't understand or you're just asleep or? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. All right, so the air barrier you can see here, it just simply limits airflow between inside and outside. That's its, that's its objective, all right? And how much it limits airflow just depends on how well we seal it, okay? Um, and what product we use, et cetera, you know, and how um, uh, good the contractor is at installing that particular product because sometimes products can only go so far, you know? Uh, you're a product manufacturer, right? And so you can tell people about your product and how well it, it, uh, it does. And, and yeah, it's great at doing X, Y, Z, but if the person installing it doesn't install it per your instructions, will it perform? Chances are no. Chances are no, not, not the way that you've described it, right? And so, and so that's the thing. So basically, you know, they're only gonna perform as well as the installer installs them. And that's the other drawback sometimes. So education comes into play there. So here's an example of uh, a pressure boundary, but also I've shown you something else here that I didn't have a slide on, and that was a thermal boundary, uh, and where the thermal boundary needs to be in contact. But I really want to just focus on pressure boundaries here because we're talking about the blower door. And most of you guys were in the last class, so I'm going to just move along with this here. Um, example where we don't have a pressure and thermal boundary that's lining up. The thermal boundary is the insulation. And what's key about thermal and pressure boundaries is they need to be continuous, just like we talked about, you know, that continuous line. Um, no breaks, because anytime we have breaks, we have gaps. If we have gaps in our air barrier, then air can leak in and out of our house. If we have gaps in our insulation or thermal boundary, then heat can move in and out of our house through conduction or radiation. 
but the insulation and the air barrier need to be in contact with one another. They need to be continue, contiguous. Just like our clothes, as I explained in the last class, this is our insulation for our body. It needs to be, on a cold day, we like to have it up against our skin, our air barrier for our body. If it is one inch away, all the way around, there's going to be a gap, and air is going to move between that insulation and our air barrier, and we're going to be cold. If it's an eighth of an inch away, all the way around, air is going to move through that eighth of an inch gap, and we're going to feel that. So on a cold day, we do what? We pull it up like this. We cinch it against our skin. We pull it tight. We zip it up. We pull the hat down over our ears. We pull the scarf around our neck because we want that thermal boundary against our skin, don't we? We don't put a hat on and put like a little, you know, cone to hold it up over our head and so it doesn't touch our hair and not our ears. And No, we want it against everything as much as possible. That's the way the insulation works in our homes too. So we want it to be touching our air barrier, okay? So just an example of a bad envelope. We've seen this already, I apologize. Uh, but uh, here we have, you know, where the insulation is not touching that floor. And this can be very problematic because this particular insulation is not an air barrier as many insulations are not. And so therefore that air is moving through that insulation and it's fine in a cold surface like this subfloor here in the summertime that is being cooled on the other side because it's air conditioning season and it's condensing and the moisture is now raining down on top of the insulation and it's causing some mold problems, okay? Mm -hmm. And also the exterior surfaces. There's two air barriers in your house. Okay. There's the exterior surfaces, which is your, uh, your substrate, your, uh, OSB, your OSB, you know, your Tyvek and all of that. Yeah. Yep. And then there's the interior, which is your drywall. So there's, there's two basically air barriers. Um, the exterior is your primary and the interior is your secondary. You want your exterior to be the tightest because you don't want um, your interior surface, your drywall, to be your primary for a lot of reasons because then if that moisture in your air from the outside is coming in and hitting that interior surface, your drywall, and then stopping right there, then you could end up with that same problem where that moisture is condensing on the back side of your drywall, just like on that subfloor. They had a lot of problems with that in Florida years ago where the, the interior surface was such a, a tight, um, uh, barrier because they had vinyl wallpaper uh, like like in hotels and whatnot um, that the moisture was coming in through the exterior surface and it would get to the inside but it wouldn't go all the way to the inside because of that vinyl wallpaper and it would stop and it would just condense and st stay inside the wall so pretty much if it gets through this outer surface it's probably better for it just go all the way to the inside so that your air conditioning system and your heating system can dry it out you know, and take care of it, or your ventilation systems can take and pull it to the outside at that point. So really, we like to teach people address it out here on the outside because this is where your elements are. This is where your humidity is on a lot of areas. If you've got any moisture on the inside of your house, it's probably because you're taking a shower or you're running, you're cooking pasta all day long, you know, or, you know, you're breathing out, you know, stop breathing. Stop cooking pasta. You know, you can minimize those things, right? No, you can control that through other sources. That's easier to control, but you can't control when it rains. You can't control the humidity outside. You can't, outdoor climates, you know, you, you, we have no control over that. But we can control how we seal this surface. We can control how tight we build this surface. And then everything on the inside we can control. So those, those two things we have control over. Whether we don't. <laughs> I think that example you gave of that, of the, of the Florida example and that vinyl wallpaper mm -hmm. is where some of the fear of having a tight building comes from. They relate, right. They, they relate that mm -hmm. to that instance and having all that mold were really, it wasn't so much, it was having a vapor, it was really a vapor barrier on the inside. Right. In a warm climate, right? It's exactly. But it's because they had a leaky house or leaky building that was allowing air movement and see what is in air but moisture see air is moisture's horse 
okay? Um, so when you think of relative humidity in, in, in like humidity levels outside, it's that moisture, that vapor is inside of air, air molecules, mm -hmm. right? So if you've got a uh, stack effect happening in your house, which is the natural movement of air in and out of your house due to air leakage, building leakage, these little holes, then that is air moving in, and if you've got air moving in and there's moisture in those molecules, then you're pulling in moisture. If you stop the air, then that moisture hits right here and drops. It can't get in. And that's what people don't seem to understand is you've got to stop air movement. That's the biggest push of moisture into your home because vapor diffusion is very slow, very slow. And I can demonstrate that very, very simply here. Hold up this piece of paper here above your head, okay? And I'll pour this out on this piece of paper. That's diffusion. Now, cut a hole in this, okay? That's air movement. Diffusion takes longer because you have to saturate every molecule in that membrane before it'll move to the other side. Complete saturation. Movement of air, you just need a hole, clear passageway. There's no restriction. Pressure difference, a little bit of wind, a little bit of pressure difference, turn on the bathroom exhaust fan, boom, you brought all that moisture right in your house. You see, so that's why we have to stop, we have to tighten up the houses. That's what a lot of builders don't seem to understand, you see, is that a lot more moisture will move in and out of your house due to a leaky house with no vapor barriers. Look at the code. The code actually is finally starting to catch up with building science. Took them 35 years, but they're finally starting to catch up. They have taken vapor barriers out of the code in mixed climates. Where are you going to put it? The vapor barrier in a mixed climate, meaning it's mixed climate, meaning you're, you're heating and cooling evenly throughout the year. The vapor barrier typically goes to the warm side of the house. Okay, so in a mixed climate, it's warm half the, si uh, half the time on the outside because it's hot, and it's warm half the time on the inside of the house because you're heating. So which side do you put the vapor barrier? You guys engineer wall panels. You need to come up with a wall panel that flip-flops halfway throughout the year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right? That down. Yes. Down. You would, you would, you'd be like, you know, grandma would be sitting there in her chair and all of a sudden, whoop, she'd be sitting outside. Like, Whoa, what happened? Well, must be March 1st, you know. What, what, what about these, these freezing 32 degree days and, and these 60 degree, 60 degree days and 32 degree nights? That's right. Yeah, you wake up in the morning, you're outside in the yard. What happened? You know. Bottom line is, we can't control that through vapor barriers, so we decided, you know what, having a tight air barrier is the better option to control that moisture because vapor diffusion is way too slow. Way too slow. And so by the time it starts to try to soak through these building materials that we have out there, it'll dry to the outside or it'll dry to the inside and we can control that. So that's why we've gone to building tight houses. And that's where the blower door can help us, direct our work scope and direct us into building a tight house. And that's what we're here to learn. What about the, the, I, think the I think the builder that built my house in, in, 08, in 04, one, I think one, a couple of the bathroom vents were just put out into the soffit. Mm -hmm. an, un, an unventilated soffit. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt it. Now, what's, what's the gig there? I mean, what, what's the problem about putting a little, one of those little flappies and be done with it? Or putting, the ventilated, ven putting a ventilated soffit in and uh, well, they, they, or whatever you call it, ventilated, I guess. It should, have a, it should have a dedicated connection to the outside because just running it to a ventilated soffit, natural stack effect moving up through that soffit is going to take that moisture and run it back up into your attic again. So nowadays, code requires that it has a dedicated connection that runs to the outside. You can't even run it over to the ventilated soffit anymore because the natural progression, the reason that those ventilated soffits are in place is to pull air in 
And if you're dumping air and moisture in this direction and your attic is wanting to pull air in to ventilate the attic, where's that moisture going to go? Right. Back up into your attic and dump against your roof deck. What are we trying to do? We're trying to dry the roof deck, not wet the roof deck. So we're working against each other. Right. You know, so. Um, I may have right. to try to dig that out. Hole saw, sure. connection. Yeah, yeah, I could do that if yeah. I could. <laughs> I got to find it first. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of mistakes have been made over the years due to lack of understanding of basic building science. Really is what it boils down to. And basic building science takes into account the physics of air, moisture, and heat movement. And once you understand the basics of air, heat, and moisture movement, right, Brian? You can apply it to a lot of stuff in your houses and really start building better and better houses. And it takes a lot, you know, and you still make some mistakes, you know, but that's really the bottom line is understanding the basic physics of air, heat, and moisture movement. So, all right. So here we have, you know, a can light that's not insulated. We have a break in our insulation uh, barrier. So naturally we're going to have some heat loss. Here we have a can light that's insulated. So we have a continuous thermal barrier. But here with a the thermal camera, we can see that something's still not right. What's not right here? We still see a lot of blue on my ceiling in my living room here. And that's because if, even though this can light is insulated, it's not insulated over the top, but there's holes in that can light. And so that can light is not airtight. And those pinholes are still showing up and allowing air movement to come into the house and on a cold day that's pulling in 49 degree air into my living room so i'm sitting there watching tv you know wheel of fortune you know on the couch and the top of my head is like frosting over right that doesn't feel too good you know and so also uh at night time you know that air is moving in the opposite direction through my can light and so that heat that i was paying for it's going out and it's hitting my roof and it's thawing and melting my roof deck, you see. So you can see where not having a continuous air barrier is allowing for an escaping of hot air and it's causing some melting of the roof. What do you do about the can? Well, Wait, how do you insulate that? Because if I'm an electrician and I run into that every, every yep. day. We can build boxes over the cans, drywall boxes, allow for uh, three to six inches of clearance on all sides and on the top, but we can build that drywall box so it's nice and airtight, and we can insulate right up to it, leave the box to where it extends just a few inches above the insulation so that if it does heat up inside that box, it allows for the heat to dissipate to the top of the box, but the box is airtight and air movement Air leakage is a greater loss of heat than radiation or conduction. Once again, a clear passageway, no restriction, will allow for very easy movement of moisture and heat versus if you had to transfer heat through a solid surface, right. you see, or moisture through a solid surface. Okay. okay. Now, every can that I use is an IC can. Okay. In, in, in insulation but, contact. Can you just put the put the insulation on top of it. But see, this is an IC can too. See, IC, right. Right. but look at that hole and that hole and that hole and that right. hole and that hole. It's not airtight. It may be insulation contact rated, but it's not airtight. Can you and, just put insulation on top of it? But insulation is not airtight. Insulation is not an air barrier. Is your sweater that you wear outside, is it airtight? Uh, not likely. No, that's the same thing that your insulation is like. It's porous. But insulation on top will reduce the flow. Yeah, it'll slow it down. But let me show you another picture coming up here that shows you why insulation is not airtight. We're getting there. Okay. So here's some of the things that we see with the blower door that can direct where to seal in the house. This is using the thermal camera in conjunction with the blower door. We can see the air movement down through the wall system here. This is a top plate. Okay. And then this is just one plumbing penetration that was left unsealed. This entire cavity here, 16 inch bay, is bright blue. 
you know. Pretty wowing, huh? So. And that's just the result of that plumbing. That's just one plumbing hole. One plumbing hole not sealed. Yeah, because once that air gets down in that cavity, it's just going to heat or cool that entire cavity. But now, has there been insulation in that cavity? Doesn't matter. Insulation is not an air barrier unless it is a two part foam that restricts air movement. That is an air barrier. Okay, this is good. Okay. This, you know, your fiberglass and your cellulose. Now, unless cellulose is dense packed to a dense, a certain density, or fiberglass nowadays that is uh, developed to be dense packed to a certain density to restrict air movement, they, you know, then they can be considered air barriers. But loose fill insulation or fiberglass bats are not air barriers. They do not restrict air movement. So why would we want to use a blower door to find holes? I mean, why couldn't we just go up there and look for the holes? <laughs> Brian's laughing. He's like, yeah, whatever, man, that's easy. Look, you see all the holes. Um, because if we're working in retrofit situations, oh, everything's already installed. I mean, yeah, if you can do it before the installation's installed, like if you're building a new house, it's easy. But this is an existing house. This is your work zone. It can be very difficult, you know. Um, so here's an example, uh, which this was a slide earlier. This is an example why just covering up that hole, whoops, covering up that hole with, with insulation doesn't stop that air movement. You can see that this insulation right here is black and this insulation here is pink, you know. We didn't install two different types of insulation. It's, we installed the pink kind, but over time, this here has been filtering the air that's been leaving the house. So it's turned black. So the insulation does not stop air movement. It may restrict it somewhat, but it does not stop it. Um, the reason that um, we don't just go crawling around the attic sometimes and just saying, okay, let's go look for all the holes, and it helps to have a blower door to direct us, and we're going to demonstrate that on the house here in a very short order, um, is because sometimes it's hard to see the holes. But where's the hole? I found this hole very quickly because I, 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 put, I put this uh, slide together last night so I knew where it was. No, because when I was doing a blower door test, I tested this cavity on the inside of the house using some pressure diagnostics that I'm going to demonstrate to you guys very shortly. And so I knew exactly where that hole was, popped up into the attic, got my bearings, and was like, whoosh, whoo, there's the hole, you know? I didn't fall in, but you know, I walked right over to it and said, right about here is where this hole is, whoosh, there it is. There's my tiger pit, you know? But that can be very dangerous if you don't know where the hole is and you slip off. Sometimes you slip off when you put your hole, your leg through maybe some drywall. That's dangerous enough, but what about falling into this thing, you know? I know, I know a stairwell like that, and what I did is, is put some plywood over. Yeah. I put plywood and, 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 and helped insulate this, this, the house. Yeah. This is exactly why I, when I go up into to somebody's house, up in their attic, I always tell them, eh, based on your size attic and what I'm looking for, I should be back in about 30 minutes or you have a big attic, give me an hour, you know. And uh, I've literally had a homeowner one time when I was up there for a lot longer than I told them, poked their head up and said, hey, are you okay? You still alive? I said, you've got a really big attic and, I, and I'm still crawling through this thing with thanks for checking on me because sometimes you can get into trouble and you may fall off of something I could have fallen down in this pit here and I'd been stuck behind her fireplace until she came and found me. You know, literally, because there's no way out. I mean, that's 12 feet deep. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you how to find these holes. You know, where do we start, basically? Because um, this is your work area. This can be confusing. Anywhere you have something poking up, you know, through the insulation, plumbing, electrical, whatever, that's easy. You know, you can go over there, pull back the insulation, there's typically going to be a hole. That's, that's a pretty safe bet, and that's easy to find. But sometimes the holes just aren't that easy to find. Um, if we know where to look, you know, like with this chart here, it kind of tells us, you know, like, 
Duct leakage is a good place to start. Uh, this is where you know, a lot of your building uh, leakage occurs, duct leakage, leakage via holes in your uh, doors, windows, ceilings, etc. Um, you know, primary air infiltration sites. Um, you know, you have a chart like this. You can kind of walk over and you can fish around and you can dig through the attic. You can pull back the insulation, but that can still be very time consuming. You know, there's a prescriptive path here, this is what I'm trying to show you. Um, Anywhere we have something poking through our air barrier and pressure plane here, we want to make sure that this is sealed appropriately. Okay, so these are things that we want to address. Here's some examples of that. You know, plumbing penetration. We love plumbers. You get a chainsaw out, cut a four by four hole, run a two inch pipe. You know, yeah, why they stop with the joist? They're, they're chain, they're chain dolled, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But, you know, there's some simple fixes. Some rigid board, some two-part foam. We can fix that hole for them, you know. Uh, open chases and byways in the attic, you know, we can fix that hole for them. So some simple things that you can do to tighten up this house very quickly uh, and very, very simply. Uh, can lights, you asked about how do we fix a can light. Here we are, there's that box, you know, drywall box over top of it, seal the edges, seal it to the drywall in the uh, attic there, and then insulate right up to it and around it, but don't insulate on the top of it. Okay? Bill, can you go back to that other one, the last one, sorry? For that part where it's in between the two walls, do you just try to seal that to minimize the air flow and you don't worry about sort of insulating those walls? Right? No, these are. The ceiling essentially as the thermal Right, this is the interior walls, so we don't need to insulate the interior walls. We're just going to extend the insulation and air barrier across this surface here where it was supposed to be to start with, exactly. Yeah, just, it's, just like, it's just like if this were, if this right here were uh, the situation and this is a, a cavity, um, we wouldn't try to insulate this because that's like insulating between this room and this room. Well, there's no real benefit unless you're wanting a sound barrier. All we're going to do is say, let's just extend the air barrier. Now we're complete, and then let's put some insulation over here because this is where my air barrier is supposed to be, my, pre my uh, envelope. It's not supposed to, it's not supposed to be like, like this, you know. <laughs> that's, that's absurd, you know. So that's all we're doing is we're just capping that off and just insulating right here. Now it goes straight across. We're, just, we're creating a bridge, basically. So you just fill, fill that on the, on the left hand side with plywood yep. and then put insulation on Exactly. It, what we don't have pictured here is insulation over top of that. We're wanting to show you how to seal that barrier. And sometimes the insulation is in such poor shape and um, some people would say if it's cost effective and easy enough to remove, then remove it. You know, uh, there are uh, uh, blowing machines out there that you can set on reverse and just suck all that dirty insulation out of your way then you can walk the top plates and find all your holes very quickly and easily because anything that you leave in the attic if there is a connection between the attic and the house potentially that dirty nasty insulation that's been in there for 50 years is a contaminant is the way some people look at it you know mice and rats and squirrels and whatever else have been crawling through it and doing their business in it and it's broken down and it's becoming dirty dusty it's a, it's a health hazard at that point, you see? And so there becomes a, 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 a point where is it cost effective to just take it all out of the house and start over. Because no matter what, when you're up there, you're gonna end up putting something in on top of it anyway. Of course. Because you're there still. Of you're course, just, okay. yeah. So yeah, because, the, because after a while, insulation just, it breaks down so much that it really is not much R value left in it anyways. And so that's where some people just say, just get it out of your way. Um, and then air seal everything. That way you can do a much more complete air sealing job and then blow new back in. Um, that's true, but right now while incandescents are still on the market and somebody could change that out, you're better off protecting yourself and not insulating over top because the IECC code specs out that you can build the box, they're okay with that, but don't insulate over top of it because if ever there is a heat problem inside, that allows the heat to dissipate to the outside. So when they completely have eliminated those bulbs, 
then maybe they'll change that, but that may be another 10 years down the road. <laughs> right now the code says don't insulate over top of it. I wouldn't insulate over top of it because all you have to do is insulate over top of it and the house burned down from some other reason and they'll say, you insulated that can light box and that fire was somewhere in that area? Yes. Mr. Contractor, hand me your truck. Keys to your house. You know. Now can you insulate you, around the side, just not the top? Right. You can insulate right up to the box. They say extend the box three inches above the insulation. That's it. Gotcha. Because what you're saving in an air barrier greatly outweighs the little bitty gap that you're going to have in that insulation. I know that there's a gap in your insulation, but what you had before with this can light and what you're gaining with this and some insulation around it greatly outweighs what you had previously. Ultimately, get rid of the can light. Yeah. I mean, if you're that worried about it, yeah, just take this guy out, seal the hole. <laughs> now, can you use the, the our can lights that, that are not, they don't have holes in it. They're IC cans without the holes in it. Even an IC can has some holes, but you're right. There are better can lights than others. Aren't there sealed can lights available? Yeah, they're airlock and airtight. Yeah, there are airlock and airtight cans, and they, and they do pretty good, yes. Do you know or Halo, they, yeah. can, they make different brands for the right. Uh, right. airtight, but they're still not completely right. airtight. Air yeah. They're just little punch outs and things yeah. like that. They're less than two CFM per, I think it's like 75 pascals of pressure difference across the uh, surface. So for them, it's considered to be airtight. That's their definition of airtight. Um, now, um, when you look at changing out this can in a rehab situation, you know, to one of those uh, can lights that you're talking about versus building a box, what's the cost difference? Probably about 10 or 15 bucks materials and labor versus probably about 50 or 60 bucks materials and labor. It's up to you and whether or not you can even get to it to change it out versus just building a box over it and going on. It's what we weigh a lot of times in rehab and weatherization work. That's what, what you have to determine. What about the retro can where you, you cannot get the first floor to a second floor, you cannot get it. You have to right. use those ones that neck over. Now, the between floors, we don't have to worry about it because between floors we're condition to condition. We're inside the envelope. The envelope is here. Building leaky or anything that's open between floors, that's not a problem. That's condition to condition. Do you know? That's like saying that that door is leaky between this room and that room. Well, that's conditioned air that's leaking to conditioned air. There's, there's, no, there's no issues. Right. Yeah. So, so let me show you briefly, because we've got about 15 minutes left. Let me show you how we use the blower door to direct our work scope on this house, okay? How do we use the blower door to find the holes on a house? And that's what I want to show you today, okay? So let me go ahead and, and get the blower door fired up here because...